Today I want to take you into the scriptures and do a Bible study on the subject of common reasons why people do not have assurance. And when I speak of assurance, I'm speaking specifically of the assurance of their salvation. In recent days, hands down, this has been at the top of the list, not even a close second. Now in recent days, and that changes depending upon the temperature of the world and Bible prophecy and things that might be going on in Israel or America, but hands down with no one even close in questions near this one is how can I be sure that I'm saved? How can I know that my heart is right with God? Can a person really know that when you die you go to heaven? Is there really a heaven? Is there really a hell? Many of these questions that are coming in focus around what I would call the subject of assurance. And so we are doing multiple teachings and making those available to you fresh on this Bible subject and they will be available on all of our social media formats going forward and I hope you'll listen to each and every one of them. So today let's focus specifically upon five common reasons why because I believe these are the most common. I sat down and I was looking at questions and I was looking at responses and I just kind of put this together out of your questions and your responses and your emails that have come into the ministry of Lost Lamb Association. By the way, our website is lostlamb.org and you can locate us there for all other information. But I put them into categories and then edit it down to what I believe are the five common reasons why people do not have the assurance of their salvation. With that in mind, let's go into the book of Colossians chapter 2. As always, if you're new to the ministry, we start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. Go down to verse 6. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Pause right there. Notice that the scripture puts an incredible amount, a cred, incredible amount of weight upon being rooted and built up in him. Anything that has roots and anything that is built is going to have a period of time necessary for the roots to grow. Now notice that the Bible, translated from the original Greek in the King James Version that I'm reading, gave us two words, rooted and built. One speaks of an invisible foundation that goes downward, roots, and then built is the visible building that goes up. If you're going to have a trajectory of growing faith and being built up in God as you begin to serve Him, you're going to have to have roots. You can't have one without the other if you're going to have long-term, satisfying, productive, and fruitful faith both roots and building. Let's read on, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh 
by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, we look to you and we humble our hearts in your holy presence and we thank you that by the Holy Spirit, you lead us and guide us into all truth. I humble my heart not only before you, but before this audience of people that you're drawing in from all over the world in unprecedented numbers. And I pray for them today. My prayer is that for all who have received Christ, that they will continue to grow in their faith, to be both rooted and built up in an ongoing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that a holy hedge of divine protection would surround each and every one of them and that nothing in this world would separate them from their walk with God. May they have a spirit of never give up. And I pray that they would each one be ready for the soon coming of Christ. I pray that you will help me to help them to better understand what it means to have the full assurance of salvation, to know that you know that you know that you have peace with God and that it is well with your soul. I pray for all of those that you're sending our way who don't have that faith and are searching and looking for spiritual answers. When the invitation is given in the moments to come at the end of this teaching for people to turn from sin and turn to Christ, I pray that you'll give to them the faith and the courage and the humility to do what they ought to do, to receive the forgiveness that is available through Christ alone. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. I ask you to lead me and guide me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And by faith, we receive it and call it done. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. In all of my many years of ministry and helping people find peace with God, this is a common struggle. I want to mention that right in the infancy of our time in the Scripture and our time studying together because I don't want someone to feel that if you're struggling with the assurance of your salvation and you have doubts and concerns and you still lay your head to the pillow at the end of the day and you think thoughts like, what if I'm not right with God? What if I were to be left behind? What if this is all an illusion? What if this is all an emotional response? And all of the questions that you may be wrestling with, I don't want you to feel that you're alone. Almost every single person who comes to Christ biblically and sincerely, they still wrestle with many doubts and concerns. Even when people have sincerely turned from sin and turned to Christ, they struggle with the wondering, am I really saved? I had a man many years ago in a church come up to me, and when he came up to me, I had spoke at that church several times, and so I knew him, I knew him by name. He was actually on the board of that church. And after the service was over, and most people had left, he came up to me and said, can I speak to you privately just for a moment? We stepped aside from those that were nearby and his eyes welled up with tears and I think he was mid-70s, maybe early 80s, I'm not really sure. But with tears in his eyes, he said, I'm embarrassed to say this, but as I'm getting older and I realize that one day I'm going to stand before God, I struggle with, am I really saved? Am I really right with God? 
Now this man, to my knowledge, is one of the most gracious Christian men that you'd ever meet. Faithfully served the Lord, loved the Lord with all of his heart, was a humble man, a godly man, well respected. There would be no reason for anyone externally to look at this man and think for one single moment that down deep inside internally, he was still struggling and not really sure of his salvation. And so this is not only a common problem with people that are newly saved. This is not just a problem with people who have just recently found faith in Christ. This is a problem that many people struggle with even after decades of serving the Lord. And so let me lay out for you where we're headed because in today's study, I'm going to focus on what I believe are the five most common reasons why people struggle with their salvation. And if you're taking notes, number one, people often lack the assurance of salvation because they still struggle with their old lifestyle and certain sins. Let me say that again because my wife oftentimes reminds me, if you're asking people to take notes, slow down so that they can have time to write it down. And I know that sometimes I'm guilty of uh, being like a fire. I just get started and rage on without thought of that. And so I apologize if sometimes I'm information overload and uh, I don't ever want our time together uh, to be like trying to get a drink of water out of a fire hydrant. And so let me say that again. Number one, people often lack assurance because they struggle with their old lifestyle and certain sins. And all of these five are going to begin with people often lack assurance because. They'll all five begin with that. People often lack assurance because, number one, they struggle with their old lifestyle and certain sins. Let's go into the Bible, into 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, and verses 5 through 10. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Verse 7. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Now pause right there. This is written by the Apostle John, and he's not writing to people who are lost or people who are godless or people who are unbelieving, he's writing this letter to Christians. Look at verse 8 again. If we, as Christians, he's writing to Christians, if we, as Christians, claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Christians should not sin, but Christians sometimes do sin. Now, we're going to deal with this in greater depth in the moments to come. But the Bible says, to whom much is given, much shall also be required. The more you grow in your knowledge and understanding of the Bible and faith in Christ, then the more victorious you should live over sin. For some of you that are listening to me, you are not living in victory over sin, but sin is living in victory over you. 
And that is not God's will. God will most certainly help you. But those who are new believers oftentimes have much to learn. And because they're new, we don't have the same expectations of a three-month-old baby as we do a 50-year-old educated man or woman who's adult and grown and learned skill sets, oftentimes has career, field of expertise, life experience, and on and on. Neither does God, though He has the same standard for all, He does not have the same, listen carefully, He does not have the same mercy with those who, whom have been given much. There is more mercy available to the new believer than to those who are willingly practicing sin after serving the Lord for years, decades, and so on. To whom much is given, much shall also be required. And just as a newborn baby does not have the life experience and the skill sets and the knowledge and the IQ and the development and so on, as a full-grown adult, so it is in the infancy of your faith. Some of the sins, some of the mistakes, some of the frailties that you're going to experience are going to come out of ignorance. You just have not yet been taught. And because you've never been taught certain things, God will be merciful to you. We'll get back to that. Verse 8, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins, again he's speaking to believers. If we as believers confess our believers sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. So believers have the potential of sinning even after they have experienced a genuine salvation and a sincere conversion. Christians are not perfect. Now, do we use the grace and the mercy of God as a license to sin? The Apostle Paul put it this way, Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't ever forget that the standard of God is perfection. He said, be ye holy, even as I am holy. The standard of God to pursue holiness is the same whether you've been saved for 10 minutes or 10 years or 10 decades. The standard is the same. The bullseye on the target is the same for all. He asks us to live a holy life. But when you fall short of the mark, and when you sin, don't give up on God, because God is not going to give up on you. First John, in this first letter, he said in verse 9, If we as believers confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's the habit that you have to develop. If you sin, if you stumble, if you do something and you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and you will, if you're really a born-again Christian, God has given the Holy Spirit as a divine tutor. In the Greek, the paraclete, one who is attached to you, walks with you, is with you when you wake up, is with you when you go to bed, is with you every hour of every day. He is attached to you as your holy tutor and teacher, and he will bring conviction. I oftentimes tell people this. 
when you get saved, pay attention to what I call a spiritual stoplight. What do you mean a spiritual stoplight? There are times in my life and I'll be around something and I'll get a flashing red light, so to speak. And I'm obviously using uh, colloquialisms to help you better illustrate and understand what I'm saying. But there are times in my spirit that unknowingly there's a flashing red light inside. And by that I mean I know that something's wrong. I recently heard a minister. And immediately within less than a minute, of listening to him speak and preach, I had a flashing red light inside. I knew that he was a false prophet. I knew he was a false teacher. I knew that he had nothing to do with God and was a wolf in sheep's clothing because the Holy Spirit gives us what I oftentimes call an internal stoplight. Now, sometimes it won't flash red, it'll flash yellow. And I'm not talking about an actual stoplight, so don't get weird and funky on me. I'm talking about a colloquialism to help you better understand, where I'll feel a strong caution. Not that it's wrong, but I'll feel, be careful. And this isn't just about people. It's about decisions. It's about life. It's about everything we do on a regular basis. The God of heaven and earth, your heavenly Father, will give you an internal discernment. And then sometimes it's green. You immediately have the peace of God. You have a knowing that it pleases God. And the greatest way to develop that green, yellow, red light internally of spiritual discernment is through a better understanding of the Bible. Because the Bible is God's written word. If you want to know God's will, read the Bible. If you want to hear the voice of God audibly, read the Bible out loud. The Bible is your roadmap that will teach you right from wrong. And so when you become a Christian, you must devote yourself to being a follower of Christ and a follower of His teachings. And the Word of God is the covenant of God and it will never fail you. You cannot serve God and willingly practice the sins of your old life. There is a difference when a person gets saved. You no longer have a desire just to please yourself. The witness of salvation is you now have a desire to please the Lord. And John addressed that here. Number two, people often lack assurance because they have questions about when they received Christ. Number two, people often lack assurance because they have questions about when they received Christ. Many people, I ask this question many times when having personal conversations with people, and they're asking me about salvation, or they have doubts, or they're dealing with these assurance issues. I'll ask them, tell me the exact time that you repented of sin and received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, for many people, without hesitation, they'll go back to an actual date or year or experience, and they'll say, you know, a friend of mine invited me to attend an event at his local church, and we were friends, and I respected him, and so I thought, why not? And so I went to church. Prior to that, I was not a person who really was religious or had an interest in church or thought, well, there's so many churches, how do you know which one to go on and so on. But I went to church with that friend and someone spoke that day and it felt like they were speaking just to me. And that day, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. They gave an invitation and said, would you like to receive 
Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And by the way, we're going to do that today for the thousands that will be listening to this over the course of time. And maybe you don't have a day. You don't have a clear, distinct memory. You can have that decision in your heart today. You know, just two days ago on my Twitter account, and I try to use all social media. I oftentimes say this, and I hope you won't be uh, judgmental in my saying this. If I weren't in the ministry, I doubt that I would be very involved in social media because that's just not my natural bent. Uh, my natural bent is if I had free time, I'd rather be in the wilderness somewhere away from people enjoying the great outdoors. And those of you that know me personally know I love the wilderness. I love the great outdoors. And uh, I find great peace and comfort. It's, it, it recharges my batteries probably better than anything else. But because I'm in the ministry, Paul the Apostle said, using every means available so that I might reach some. And so years ago when social media was in its infancy of popularity but growing, I determined in my heart that though that was not my natural bent, it had the potential of reaching people that may not be reached otherwise. And thank God I was obedient to do that because as I've mentioned to you, in recent uh, months there have been over 2 million, probably maybe now over 3 million people who have how they're listening to. To us. And it may be or maybe already is at the point where I'm reaching more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ through media than through our Lost Lamb events that we uh, set up and travel to, both domestically and in foreign outreaches. It's amazing. Just the other day, I got a private message on the social media platform called Twitter. And it was from a man, and he said that, in essence, I found your ministry on YouTube. I wasn't even looking for anything religious, but came across you and clicked on it, and it piqued my interest, and I listened to it. And since I have found you, I've been binge-watching your videos on YouTube. He said, this month, July 22nd, is my birthday and I have made up my mind that on my birthday I'm going to give my heart to Jesus Christ and repent of my sins. Well, I messaged him back and I said, I'm so thankful that you've connected with me and thankful that you're listening and learning. But concerning giving your heart to Jesus Christ, on July 22nd, what if Jesus were to come on July 21st? And then I gave to him a scripture that the Apostle Paul wrote out of the book of Corinthians that says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You can't get saved yesterday and you can't get saved tomorrow. You can only get saved when your faith is now. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is, and it goes on to define faith. But you could accurately transfer that and say, not only now faith is, but faith is now. Faith is always a now decision. And so I responded to him with what I just shared. Well, yesterday morning when I woke up, and I took time to check the responses of people on social media, which is taking more time than I have in recent days and weeks. But I saw his response, and his response was this. He said, I showed that verse and your response. I think he said he was at his mother's house, and I think he said it was his aunt, the three of them that were at the table. And someone opened the Bible and looked for that scripture. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of your salvation. And we read that scripture. And I thought you'd like to know 
that we all gave our hearts to Jesus Christ. You need to have the knowledge of the day that you have repented of sin and received Jesus Christ. And some of you that are listening to me will always struggle with your salvation because you don't have any foundational memory of when you did make that commitment. Let me give you another example. My wife Judy and I just celebrated our 42nd anniversary. And uh, we were married when we were young. I was only 20 years old. But I remember my wedding day. It was June 23rd, 1979, in a little town in southwest Pennsylvania called Washington, Pennsylvania. The church was actually in a smaller town called Houston, Pennsylvania, and the reception was in Washington, Pennsylvania, two small communities attached one to the other. But on May, or excuse me, June 23rd, 1979, I stood before God, family, and friends. I had graduated from Bible college in May, but on June 23rd, gave my heart to my wife in marriage. I'll always remember if someone asks me, are you married? Well, I remember the day that I made that commitment. I remember the day of my salvation. I was actually only six years old, and I still remember certain details. My father was pastoring a church in a little town called Mount Morris, Pennsylvania, and there was an evangelist that he had in to speak at the church. His name was L.K. Dodge. He has since gone home to be with the Lord. I don't remember his sermon. I don't remember his doctrine and his theology. But I remember in my mind something that he said even today, all these years later. I remember him saying something like this. Your father may be a wonderful Christian, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. Your mother may be a wonderful Christian mother, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. Every person must personally repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ. Now, I was only six. My father was the pastor of the church. And so when he said, your father may be a wonderful Christian, my father was sitting on the platform behind him in a chair as he was speaking in the pulpit. When he said, your mother may be a wonderful Christian, my mother was sitting over by the piano because she played the piano. But when he said, you must personally make your own commitment to Christ, at the age of six, I thought, I want to do that. And that night when that evangelist gave the invitation to receive Christ at the age of six, I went forward and knelt at the altar with others and gave my heart to Jesus and committed my heart to him. People oftentimes say, what kind of commitment can a six-year-old kid make? I made one that has lasted my entire life. Because when you receive Christ, something supernatural happens internally that's beyond you, that's beyond where you're at, that's beyond your past and beyond your weaknesses and frailties. And the Bible said in John chapter 3, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And I remember the day that I was born again and gave my heart to Christ. Luke, the apostle that Jesus had selected, one of the twelve, in Luke chapter 12, he said in verses 8 and 9, he said, I tell you the truth, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. But anyone who denies me here on this earth will be denied before God's angels. Almost every single night, and I say almost every single night, I only say almost probably 100% of the time, every night when I speak in our Lost Lamb outreaches, no matter what I'm speaking on, I ask the audience this question, and I'd like to ask the question to you. And here's the question that I ask almost every night of my life. I ask the audience this. Do you have 
a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you personally and publicly repented of sin and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And then in the closing moments, I always extend the invitation and people come forward and pray who have the faith and the courage and the humility to repent of sin and receive Christ. I'm going to do that in just a moment for those of you who may be listening who don't have a clear, distinct memory. And when you're done praying with me today, write it down. Write down the date. Write down the time. If you have a Bible, write it in your Bible and say in your Bible, this is my spiritual birth certificate. On July 6th, 2021, I repented of sin and personally and publicly gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Number three, people often lack assurance because they have questions about how they received Jesus Christ. Many of the people that write in and ask questions, this is another one that was at the top of the list of common questions. People often lack assurance because they have questions about how they received Christ. In other words, they doubt, was my experience authentic? When I did A, B, and C, was this real salvation or is this man-made? And they have questions about the experience. People are sometimes confused by the various presentations of the gospel that they may have been exposed to. In Billy Graham crusades, many of you hear me mention many times Dr. Billy Graham. And uh, he is not only a hero in the faith, but when I felt like God called me into missions and evangelism at 17, I felt a strong prompting of the Lord, be a lifelong student of Dr. Billy Graham. And I have been. I think I own every book he's ever written and have read them all, many of them repeatedly. I listened to his crusades growing up. I listen to them still on YouTube in the Billy Graham classic crusade messages. And I was actually reading the comments under one of the videos this week, and there were over 400 comments just under one video recently, and I read them all. And repeatedly... It struck me, people said, he reminds me of Billy Graham, or he sounds like Billy Graham. Now, obviously, there was only one Billy Graham, and I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. God used him in incredible ways. But apparently, all of my reading, all of my studying, all of my watching of Billy Graham, there must have been some impartation of his evangelistic ministry that God in some way has imprinted upon my own heart. And I actually, to be honest with you, I'll be very transparent, I had two responses uh, in reading those comments of people saying, he reminds me of Billy Graham or he sounds like Billy Graham. My first response was, Lord, help me never to try to imitate anyone but to be authentic and to be who you called me to be. Don't let me be in any way fake or, or, or replicate of anything other than what you've called me to be. And then my second response was, Lord, in some small way, use me in the way that you use Billy Graham. And in the Billy Graham Crusades, he invited people to come forward publicly. And I do that in all of our Lost Lamb events because of Luke chapter 12, where I just read it to you. If you confess me publicly before men, I will confess you openly before my Father which is in heaven. But if you're ashamed of me, Luke went on to say, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father and the angels. Billy Graham used to oftentimes say, there's something about doing it publicly that seals it and makes it sure. In some churches, people invite uh, people to receive Christ by coming forward to the altar at the church. Other pastors in churches tell people, you don't have to come forward. Just raise your hand there at the seat and God will see your hand and I'll pray for you. 
Other pastors say, you don't have to come forward. You don't have to raise a hand. We're not going to embarrass you. Just think it in your heart. And God knows your thoughts. And I'll include you in my benediction prayer. Other pastors have other methods. And some people have prayed a sinner's prayer, maybe with a minister on television or a, a podcast channel. More and more we're seeing this through our own ministry as hundreds of people are responding and saying, I received Christ watching you on YouTube. I received Christ watching you on Facebook. I received Christ after listening to your podcast channel. I received Christ after following you on Twitter and so on. God is using many means of reaching people all over the world. But the problem is because people have seen so many methodologies, they oftentimes have doubt about their salvation because they wonder, should I have done it this way or should I have done it that way or should I have done it the way Billy Graham did it or should I do it the way Pastor so-and-so did it or should I do it the way that Brother Shuttlesworth taught? Here's what I want you to remember. To be really saved, and by the way, We'll come back to this. God knows your heart. But the Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you're saved. You can't do those things without experiencing the first step into the doorway of having peace with God. We'll come back to that in greater detail. Number four, people often lack assurance because they have questions about what does it mean to receive Jesus Christ. In other words, people say things like one question that came in, I sincerely want to be a real Christian, but what do I do now? Somebody wrote and said, do I need to attend a certain type of church or belong to a certain type of denomination to be a real Christian? Somebody wrote and said, what translation of the Bible should I read? Somebody wrote and said, once I pray the sinner's prayer with you, is that all there is? Somebody asked this question, did my prayer of salvation come with an unconditional guarantee. Somebody asked this question, why are there so many different views on salvation on the internet? And so misinformation and misunderstanding cause people to have questions and questions give birth to doubts and doubts give birth to a lack of of assurance. They have questions and wonder, did I do it the right way? What does it really mean to receive Jesus Christ? Forget about methodology. Forget about how a certain denomination does it. Forget about how a certain preacher does it or a certain pastor does it, or a certain ministry, including my own, on social media does it, and go back to the Bible. There needs to be a clear explanation. Your salvation is real, not because of methodologies, but because of the sincerity of your heart when you prayed. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, and all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can call upon the Lord in an evangelistic outreach. You can call upon the Lord in a local church. You can call upon the Lord listening to a preacher on television. You can call upon the Lord listening to perhaps even myself on social media platforms. Don't base your salvation upon methodology. Base your salvation upon the message of the Bible. If you called upon the Lord out of a heart of sincerity and you were genuine, God knows your heart. 
It doesn't matter if you were in a hotel room. It doesn't matter if you were driving down the highway in an 18-wheeler as one of our friends who recently gave their hearts to Christ found us and gave. They were listening to our music CD. And in our last recording session in Nashville, in our album that some of you have called Timeless, in that CD and in that musical package of recording, I did something I've never done before. I told the producer, I said, I want to do a simple song that I learned as a little boy in Sunday school. The lyrics are into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And someone who's watching today, live, sent our CD to their brother who drives an 18-wheeler and somehow, some way, as he was driving and listening, the Spirit of the Lord met him on an interstate highway. And if I remember the story right, he pulled into a rest area. And in a rest area, in an 18-wheeler, on an interstate, he called upon the name of the Lord the best way he knew how. And God met him there and forgave him there and gave him newness of life, and his name was written in the Lamb's book of life. God doesn't necessarily need a church. You don't necessarily have to be in a building with stained glass windows. You don't have to listen to a preacher in a long flowing robe with various degrees behind their name. You, through sincerity, can call upon the Lord. Don't focus upon the methodology. Focus upon the message and your sincerity. Lastly, and I close with this, many people struggle with the assurance of their salvation because no one ever explained to them what I call the primacy of the gospel. Now, if that confuses you, hold on. I'm going to conclude the study right now by explaining that to you, and then we're going to pray. Number five, many people struggle with the assurance of their salvation because they don't understand the primacy of salvation. Now, let me encourage you. In one of our next upcoming teachings and times together, in Bible study, I'm actually going to teach on this, and that will be the entire teaching. And so I'm going to be abbreviated in my comments here, but it's so important that as I was writing and praying and studying, I thought as I was concluding my notes for our time together today, this is so vitally important. It deserves an entire study. And so there will be a study upcoming on the assurance of salvation based upon these wonderful things. How can I be sure of my salvation? I want you to write that down. And if you're listening now, probably within a week to 10 days, this teaching will be on our social media formats. How can I be sure of my salvation? And I'll deal with this in great detail, but let me give you the skeletal system of this theologically. Every person who is genuinely saved takes the exact same four steps. I'm pausing to give you time to write it down. If you've genuinely been saved, if you're genuinely right with God, if you want to be sure of salvation, you need to understand the primacy of salvation. Every true Christian goes through the same four steps. And here they are in conclusion. Number one, they hear the gospel. Number one, you have to hear the truth of the gospel. And not everybody that preaches and teaches or calls themselves a pastor or a prophet or a spiritual leader or an evangelist preaches the true gospel. 
Let me give you an example. There is a very popular trend in cultural Christianity right now that I call easy believism. People who are preaching, all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. No, there's a lot more to it than just believing. The Bible says in James chapter 2 and verse 19, even the demons believe and tremble. Demons believe in Jesus Christ as God's only son, but they're not saved. And easy believism is not true conversion. Number one, you have to hear the true gospel. Number two, you have to believe in your heart the true gospel. And again, I'm going to do an entire teaching. This is so important that I'm going to give an entire teaching on it. I pray that you'll follow up by listening to it because it's incredibly valuable for you to understand if you're going to have the assurance of salvation. Number one, you have to hear the true gospel. Number two, you have to believe in your heart the truth of the gospel. Number three, you must repent of your sin. Jesus said in Luke 13, unless you repent of your sin, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no such thing as true salvation without true repentance. And we'll get back to that. But repentance, as you're going to learn in the next study, repentance involves several steps. It requires a change of mind. It requires a change of direction. And it requires a change of lifestyle. The word repentance in the New Testament, we don't use that word much in our modern day and age, but the word repentance basically in most simple definition means make a U-turn. You're headed in the wrong direction, you need to make a U-turn. And number four, you must confess with your mouth. And as you're going to learn in the next study that we'll do together, confession does not mean confess your sins. It does not mean list all of your sins, past and present. Many of you couldn't remember them. And if to be genuinely saved, you had to confess, actually list your sins alphabetically and numerically, some of you would have no chance of being saved. You could never recall and remember all of your sins. The word confess from the original Greek does not mean confessional or make a list or list out, talk about all your past. That's not what it means. The word confess from the original Greek is rendered as make vocal agreement with the covenant of God. True confession that leads to salvation is not writing all of your sins down alphabetically and numerically. Confession. If a man believes in his heart, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if a man believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, you are verbally agreeing with the covenant of God. In other words, what you believe in your heart is validated by the words of your mouth. Confess. Now there's a lot of meat on that bone. So much meat on that bone as I've already announced. In our next Bible study, we will open the scriptures and continuing on this series of how to have the assurance of salvation, I'll spend an entire session with you going over those four things. That Bible study will be entitled, How Can I Be Sure of My Salvation? And we'll revisit those four things. Hear the true gospel. Believe in your heart the truth of the gospel. Repent of your sins and confess with your mouth, and we will revisit that in our next study. There, my precious friend, are, and there are multiple. I obviously uh, can't list and teach on every doubt and concern of salvation, but those are the most five common reasons why people lack the assurance 
of their salvation. And if you're struggling or if you're battling, there'll never be any condemnation from me. I love you. I appreciate you. And no matter where you're at, this ministry exists to help you. I have dedicated my entire life to sinners, atheists, agnostics, people who oppose the gospel, people who do not believe. I have dedicated my entire life to sinners. The last time I read the Bible, it said Jesus was the friend of sinners and Lost Lamb Association exists to reach unreached people. And so if you're one of those individuals and you're not a Christian, you're just listening, you're just seeking, you're just trying to gain information, you're on a quest, wherever you might be, you need to get ready to meet the Lord. But until you make that commitment, I'm here for you. I'm not here to accuse you or judge you or to, or to make some type of difficult judgmental statement about your past. And I am here hoping that God might use me in some small way to build a bridge from where your heart is now to the cross of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is coming soon and you need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. If you're watching this broadcast and you perhaps are not ready to meet the Lord, I never close a time in the Bible, I never close a Bible study, I never close a service without giving people an opportunity to receive the assurance of salvation. Today you can truly hear the gospel. What is the essence of the gospel? The essence of the gospel in a very small thumbnail is this, God by nature is holy, man by nature is sinful. And our sinfulness separates us from a holy God. Thereby God gave His only begotten Son, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the sinful world, separated from a holy God, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God doesn't want you to perish that word perish from the original text means face judgment for unrepented sin. If you never repent of sin, you will meet a God of wrath and judgment according to the Bible. And God said, that's not my will. Hell was not prepared for the human race. Matthew and Jesus taught us that hell was prepared for Satan and the fallen angels. God said in 2 Peter 3 and 9, I'm willing none should perish. John 3, 16, none should perish. But you have to make a choice. You hear the gospel. You believe in your heart. You're willing to repent of your sin and confess with your mouth. You're making a, an agreement, a verbal covenant of agreement with the truth of God. Will you do that with me right now in simple prayer? wherever you might be. Some of you are thinking, Tiff, I don't know about all of this. This is new to me. People are writing us from around the world who have never seen a Bible and didn't even know what the book was that I was calling the Bible. Wherever you might be, there is no judgment, no shame. Wherever you're starting, God loves you. Sin has separated you from His holy presence and right relationship. But through Jesus Christ, Christ became the bridge between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. Today you can confess and believe and pray and start your journey with the Lord. Will you do that with me right now, wherever you might be, if that's your heart's desire? Pray with me. Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, today, right now. Pray this with me wherever you might be. Father in heaven... Today, as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I want to be a real Christian. I want to know that I have peace with God. I want to know that my sins are forgiven and forgotten. And so today, I am willing to repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I trust in the cross and in the blood that was shed that cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Come into my heart. 
Be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day I will serve the Lord. I can't do that in my own strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to be what I ought to be. Now according to the Bible, all who call upon your name shall be saved. And not because of methodology, but because of the clarity of God's message. I have sincerely called upon your name and I am saved. I am no longer the property of sin. I am today a child of God. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, number one, I'm so glad that you did. And I'm so proud of you. But it's not the end of what God's going to do with your life. It's just the beginning. And so today I want to help you to be rooted and built in your faith. And this is just day one, like a baby born moments ago. You have your whole life of faith ahead of you to grow in the things of the Lord. I want you to do something. If you are sincere, I want you to write me an email just briefly at info at lostlamb.org. If you're watching on Facebook Live, all of the information is on the screen. If you're watching YouTube, the information is on the screen. If you're listening to the podcast, it's info, I-N-F-O, at lostlamb.org. And when I say info at, it's the at symbol, info at lostlamb.org. Just write me a brief email and just say, I was listening to the broadcast. If you would name the broadcast, it would help us. But you can just say, I was listening to your broadcast and I prayed the sinner's prayer and I meant business with God. And if you will just send me the email, I want to send you, first of all, this book entitled God's Very Own Child that will better explain to you. You can sit down and read it in a matter of moments. It won't take long but it covers the high points of what it means to be a real Christian and to become a child of God. I'll send that to you for free. I'll also send you one hour of teaching, an audio from one of my teachings entitled Living the Christian Life. Every successful Christian has four habits. I'll teach them to you and show you how to establish those habits as a foundation to your faith. I'll also send you our Lost Lamb Covenant. There are seven places, and you can begin to write down the names of seven friends or family members that need Christ and make them a part of your daily prayer life, that the Lord will help them in the same way that He's reached out and helped you. Now, if you want to pray for more than seven, that's fine. I had a man that wrote recently and said, I have multiple of your lost lamb covenants, and every day I'm praying for 92 people. Well, that's an ambitious soul winner right there, and that makes me happy. We'll send all of these to you, and by the way, they're free. No charge. There'll never be an invoice, and uh, even the postage and handling is free. And uh, please, write me that email. Come in today, 
come in to stay Come in to my heart, Lord Jesus